Praise the Lord, everybody. Good to see each and every one of you in the house of the Lord on this Wednesday night. It's been a great day, a beautiful day outside. Thank God for the opportunity and the chance to be in his house. To one more time worship him freely, amen. A lot of places in this world that don't have the opportunity to come into a place like this to join together with brothers and sisters and praise and magnify God, but we are given this opportunity today, and I don't want to take it for granted, amen? So if everybody will, let's just give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank Him for the opportunity to be here tonight, amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a mighty God we serve, and I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. Glad to see each and every one of you. If you have any prayer requests tonight, just let it be made known by the raising of your hand. The Lord knows each and every one of them. Let's go before him tonight with these needs. Lord Jesus, we magnify you, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings that you've given us. We thank you for your hand of protection, your mercy, and your grace that you've shown to each and every one of us, Lord. God, you've granted us one more opportunity to be in your house tonight, to praise you and to magnify you, to thank you for all you've done, Lord. God, there's many that come into this place tonight, God, that have needs and sicknesses and pains, whatever the need may be. God, you said you know each and every one of them before we even ask. And I ask and pray in this place tonight, God, that you will move and intervene on every situation, every circumstance, whatever it may be. God, that all praise and glory and honor will be given to you for it, Lord, because you're the only one that deserves it. We thank you for it. We praise you and we magnify you, for you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is no one like you, Lord Jesus. Your word says, God, that, that, that you look to the left, to the right, to the front, and to the back. God, and when, when Job didn't know which way to go, he said, you know the way that I take. So no matter how weary we are, no matter how broken we feel, no matter what we've been going through this day, we can enter into this place. We can lift our hands. We can lift our voices. And we can raise our heads to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and give you all honor and glory and praise. And we thank you for this opportunity one more time. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.
something in the bulletin Sunday that I want to read real quick. And you may be seated. It says, growth is painful, change is painful. But nothing is as painful as staying stumped, stuck somewhere where you don't belong. A lot of times in our life, we, we try to do things our own way. We take our own route, our own path. And it seems like sometimes we're stuck. But when we lift our eyes to the hills from which cometh our strength, our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. When I realize I can't do it by myself, Brother Shannon, I can't walk this road alone. I have to have him leading me and guiding me and directing me, showing me which way to take, helping me keep my attitude right, helping me keep my spirit right. It takes him every day, and I have to be willing to listen to his voice to allow him to mold me and make me into what he wants me to be. And when I do that, I become more like him. And that's my prayer, to be more like him every single day that I live, that other people in this world that I come in contact with, when they see me, they don't see me, but they see him in me. Amen? Amen. Amen. If we can, this beautiful Wednesday night, we're going to give you the ways to give on the board. We have Givelify, PayPal. Available at riverbendpentecostals.com. You can send your cash and checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We also have text to give, which is 833-883-9311. You all stand. We're going to say this prayer tonight. We're going to pray it like we mean it. Amen. I know a lot of times if you're not careful, it just becomes old hat. And you're just saying words. But if you really believe and say what you mean in your heart and allow God to speak through you when you read this prayer and pray this prayer. I believe if you do it with a, he said he loves a cheerful giver, amen. So if you do it with a cheerful heart and a thankful heart for the blessings that he's given you, you're going to be blessed, amen. So let's say this prayer tonight. Upon the authority of your word, I have given and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaken together and running over. I'm a tither and I give my offerings. And I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked and the curse is broken. And I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there's not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessings. I'm blessed going in, and I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come and give with what the Lord has blessed you with.
seated in the house tonight. That verse said, talks about breath of life, I breathe you in. I remember I was probably, Brother Richard, I was probably, I don't know, my early 20s, late 19, 20 years old. And I was on the shipping dock working at Naranda. And my side began to hurt a little bit, Brother Terrence. And I was putting pallets on a truck, and I was loading some cables on there and wire, and strapping them up, banding them up, and I'd send the trucks on their way. And the longer the night get, the harder it got for me to take a breath. And about three days into that, I worked all week, and about the last day, I was humped over like this here. I couldn't stand up straight. The side was hurting. I couldn't breathe. And a guy told me, he said, He's passed on now, but he said, Bo, I think you might have pleurisy, son. And I went to the doctor, and that's exactly what I had. And I realized at that moment that not being able to breathe is a serious thing. When you can't get your breath, it makes you think about a whole lot of things. And at 19 years old, 20 years old, however old I was, I began to ponder a lot of things that I've never really thought about when I was breathing normal. And as I sing that song, I can't help but think of that moment in my life that the breath that I have, I should not take it for granted. But every single breath that I have is given of God. And I want that breath somehow, some way, in every aspect of my life to give honor and praise back to the God that created me. Amen. So let every word that I speak, let my actions, let everything I do somehow, some way, Bring honor to him that he would receive all honor, praise, and glory because he's the only one that deserves it. Amen. If all of us can tonight, this breath that he's given us in one voice, can we just tell him thank you for what he's blessed us for? Just give him praise for one moment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We magnify you, God. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've given us, God. You are worthy, Lord, of our praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I can get the River Bend kids to come up. We're going to allow them to go back tonight. I love these group of kids. Amen. All of you adults that's out there, if you'd lift your hands toward these babies, we're going to pray for them tonight. That God would bless them, that they would glean from the word that's going to go forth, and they could take it and give it to everybody they come in contact with. Amen. Lord Jesus, we give you honor, we give you praise. Your word says, suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God, I pray that you bless them, strengthen them tonight. God, I pray that you open their ears, help them to hear and understand your word as it goes forth. God, I pray that you help them to hide it in their heart, that every day that they live, God, somehow, some way, your word will begin to grow in them. And they can give it to those that they come in contact with. God, use them, keep them, and protect them, not only them, but their families as well, Lord, and help them to be a light everywhere they go. We give you honor, praise, and glory for each and every one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. Braxton, take them on back, buddy. Or Rhett, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rhett. Y'all done swap spaces on me. All right. River been ignited. I can't call them kids no more. I get dirty looks when I do that. Brother Blake, they're getting big. They're all grown up. I remember... When I was this age, I kind of wish sometimes I was back at that age. The man I'm looking at in the mirror ain't the same man I was back then, Brother Richard. But I thank God for every opportunity, every cut, and bump, and bruise, and everything that I've got because that just means I'm alive. Amen. All right, if we can lift our hands to these young people tonight, let's pray that God would protect them, Brother Richard and Brother Tripp, and them in the back, that He would guide them and lead them and direct them. Lord, we love you. We thank you for each and every one of these young people, God. God, I know the struggle that we go through, God, at a young age, God, the things that they battle in their hearts and their minds and being torn from one place to another. But, God, I know that you're the God that keeps them and protects them. You're the God that goes before them, Lord, and I pray that you keep your hand of mercy and grace upon each and every one of them. Help them not soon forget, God, everything that they're taught, everything that they've heard, Lord. Help them to hide it in their heart that they will not sin against you, but that they'll be more like you every day that they live. 
Help them to be examples, God, everywhere they go, to be the light on this earth, God, to be salt on this earth, to be a blessing to everybody they come in contact with. Bless the teachers in the back to impart words of wisdom and knowledge to them, Lord. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Amen and amen. Amen. Brother Shannon, I guess it's this time. I'm going to have Brother Shannon come and he's going to deliver the word tonight, a lesson, whatever he's got. Sister Amanda just told me, we, we forgot to put this in the bulletin, and I forgot to remind her. November the 18th, that's this coming up Saturday, is our focused prayer schedule. So there'll be somebody praying at 6 a.m., somebody praying at 12 a.m., and somebody praying at 6 p.m. That's November 18th, and I will put it in the back on my way back around. So all of you that will, please make it a point to put your name on there somewhere. It's just three separate times for one hour apiece. 6 to 7, from 12 to 1, and from 6 to 7. So, if you don't mind, put your name on there. At this time, Brother Shannon, come on up. I got to get my timer. My daughter told me if I went over 20 minutes, I was fired. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Everybody glad to be in church tonight? Yeah. Well, I am extremely honored to, uh, through our pastor, for giving me this opportunity. Although I will say um, this is not what I envisioned for me to be doing. I I'm, I'm feel really comfortable and in the setting that uh, we do in recovery. Um, but how many people know when you go to teaching, uh, what you teach, you end up having to do. And we've been teaching that you got to stretch and that you got to do more and you got to be out of your comfort zone. And, and then the pastor called me and said, hey, I want you to teach Wednesday night. And I'm like, okay, I will. Um, because I, I have to, because that's where we're teaching. But I am so thankful for the opportunity he's given me. I'm thankful for my pastor to be submitted to my pastor. He's my friend. He's, he's, uh, he's a man of, of God in my life, and I'm thankful for what he speaks into my life. Um, thankful for my wife. Thankful that she's been here through this whole journey with me and everything she's had to put up with and, and all the encouragement and support she gives me. And uh, just thankful thankful for what God's doing in my life. He's done a million things for me, and I, I just can't imagine that I would even be standing up here tonight uh, trying to teach a lesson, but uh, anyway, we're going to do it. So uh, the pastor asked me to teach something um, that, uh, that, that we do in recovery and kind of bring recovery to the church for the ones that hadn't been here, and I, I'm pretty comfortable with with uh, this process and what we teach. <clears throat> so tonight we're going to talk about a few things, which is step one um, that we deal with, which is denial um, and being powerless. Um, so um, tonight or this week, God has really, he's really been working on me. Uh, the closer I get to God, the more aware I am of, of what he's doing and what he's trying to say to me. Sometimes it takes me a couple days to, to understand what he's trying to say to me. Uh, sometimes it's immediate, but, but sometimes it takes a few days. But for the ones that's in my life and know what's been going on in my life, my old truck I got, um, is, uh, it's a 1999 Ford Ranger, and I bought it five years ago for $2,100 from Clint Tanner, Billy's son, and it's been an awesome truck to me, but it started giving me problems. And here lately... It has, uh, it's been cutting out on me as I drive down the road, which makes my drive to, to work very, very aggravating. 
because to say the least, it, it, it's, it's not a peaceful ride. I'm worried about it. It's just not running right. There's something, there is a problem somewhere in my truck and I am not a mechanic. It's very aggravating, annoying, it causes me anxiety, it causes me to be unhappy. I just really want it to run right. One of the main things that makes it more aggravating is the fact that I don't have the money for a major repair or for something to, if something's wrong with it, I don't have the money to fix that at the moment. And so because of that, I have a fear that a major repair may be needed that I choose to do nothing about. So because I don't have the money to fix it, I basically deny that I've got a, got a problem with my truck and I put up with this ride every single day that is so unhappy and so miserable and then I'm worried and upset and I don't do what I'm supposed to do. And, and so anyway, I took Stacy the other day. We went up to the deer woods. We had the hot dog roast for deer season and, and I took her up there and it shook and it just was awful. And she, she was in there and, and I said, you know, I have got to figure out what's going on with this truck. So that was made my mind up. My wife has a tendency to make me do things. So um, there, there was another problem I have. So I'm not a mechanic, so I don't have the tools I need to fix my truck. So that's another reason that I'm fearful about doing this. And, 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 and so not having the tools uh, causes another problem. So I decided I was going to fix my truck. I was going to get the tools I needed. I've done a bunch of research to figure out what it could be based on what it was doing. I got a socket set. I got a wrench set. Uh, the mass airflow sensor um, could be bad. So I got some special cleaner that said you had to have that cleaner. I got carburetor cleaner because I thought I had a vacuum leak. And it, it, if you sprayed it just right, it's going to help you if you have a, a, a vacuum leak. I, got a, I went to Tripp's house and we got an electronic tool to to scan the truck to figure out if there's any codes in it. I got an air filter and all these different things. And I started researching the symptoms to see what I needed to do first. So I replaced spark plugs, plug wires, new coil pack, new air filter, clean the sensor, check for codes, reset the codes. Now here's the crazy thing is, I still don't have my truck fixed. <laughs> but what I started to notice was that I was not near as fearful about working on my truck. I called Brother Chris a couple times, and Derek, he called me one time trying to help me, but I'm finding out now that I'm not near as fearful about working on my truck. Uh, I'm not scared to death it's going to be a major deal. I've already checked the codes. There's no major codes in it. And I'm actually starting to enjoy working with my hands a little bit and doing some work on my truck. And I actually, when I raise the hood, I know, I know what's under there. I know a coil pack. I know a, a, a spark plug goes. I know, you know, so it's becoming, I'm learning more about my truck. So all that to say this is recovery gives us the tools that we need to start repairing the damage that's been done in our life. Very often, we've been so fearful of trying to repair the damage that we just choose to be in denial that we have a problem. We just keep on going with that aggravating issue. And here's the deal, you know, as I, as I sat and, and thought about saying this to people, because I know how I am, I'm very easy uh, to, uh, to, to act like everything's okay. And I know everybody else is too. But only we know, you and God, know if there's an issue. And as, as I talk to more people and as I'm, uh, we, we, we deal with people in recovery, sponsor people, and, and a lot more people are getting honest. I'm finding out that we all have problems that need to be dealt with. Um, we, very often we're so fearful of trying to repair the damage, we just choose to be in denial about the problem, so we ignore it, we push it down. We are powerless, scared to fail. Sometimes we just do nothing which is not a good thing too. And that's my big thing is sometimes I just choose not to do anything. The serenity prayer tells us that we have to know the difference between things we cannot change 
and the courage to change the things we can. When we are in denial and we are powerless about our situation, our life definitely becomes unmanageable. See, my truck was getting me from here to work just fine, but there was something that just was not right. I had to be willing to dig in and find the problem to um, figure out what was going on in my truck and to have a more peaceful ride, to enjoy life, to, to get up and be able to enjoy that drive every day. Uh, many times in my own life, I knew something just, just wasn't right, but I just, not, just wasn't sure what the problem was. So that brings us to recovery. So let's talk about something. We talk about hurts, habits, and hang-ups, which is, do we agree, that's the problems in our life that cause us to be disconnected from the presence of God, causes us to be disconnected from a relationship with God, causes us to have a, a messed up ride to work or a messed up life because we're so concerned with all the different things that's going on. Um, so church could be a hurt habit or a hang up. Family, work, our boss, any type of broken relationship, now, here's the easy ones that everybody likes to talk about, smoking, which I can tell you all about, meth, I can tell you all about, weed, I can tell you a little bit about, prescription pills, a whole lot about, eating. Here's the deal, I made fun, I used to get mad at the pastor because he'd want to talk to me about quitting doing dope, which obviously I wanted to, but, but I couldn't. But he wanted to talk to me, just quit, just quit. Well, I'd want to get on to him about, well, just quit eating. You know, well, now I'm, I've quit doing drugs, and I'm finding I love to eat. <laughs> so I'm having to eat every word I ever said to him. Don't talk about the pastor because it will come back to you. But uh, I told him the other day I've quit smoking. It's been over a year now, and every piece of food tastes good, every onion, every pepper. It doesn't matter what it is. It tastes good, and I want to eat all of it. So eating can cause a problem. Pornography is a big problem in our community and, and, and everywhere. Low self-esteem, need to control, depression, anger, fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, perfectionism, codependency. We need to talk about codependency because that's a big thing and that's, that's active in a lot of church families. It's a circular relationship in which one person needs the other person who in turn needs to be needed. The codependent person known as the giver feels worthless unless they are needed by that other person. It's a miserable prison to be in, and it's something very active in our church. And I'm not saying that condemning. I'm just saying that because I've talked to people and I know it's an issue that needs to be dealt with. And enabling, enabling, being an enabler is someone who persistently behaves in enabling ways justifying or indirectly supporting someone else's potential harmful behavior. In other words, enabling is directly or indirectly supporting someone else's unhealthy tendencies. These behaviors can include alcohol or substance abuse. So a crucial part of recovery happens in step one. It encourages you to step out of denial, and without this step, you can accomplish, you cannot accomplish any other steps that are necessary for your recovery. You won't be ready to move forward until you admit you have a problem. Uh, you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there, right? Jeremiah 6.14 tells us, They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. You, when, when there's a wound, uh, you, you, it cannot heal unless you say it's there. There's so many times in our recovery class, and many of you know because you're there, is the, the very night that you have the courage, I remember somebody specifically, and I won't say their name, but they're here tonight, but I remember they broke down and, and, and just started to weep when they finally were able to actually say what they struggled with because there is such a, uh, a liberty in the fact that you can admit, finally admit, because we feel so alone, we feel like we're the only person that's dealing with these problems, and when we finally are able to admit that, there is so much peace that comes with that. Also, this step teaches us that we're powerless to control our tendencies to do the wrong thing. 
You learn you're not alone on this journey toward recovery. And once you learn you're not in control of everything, you can move forward in recovery. Up until now, most of us have been playing God in our own life, and it shows because our life had become unmanageable. Only you and I know if our life has become unmanageable. And one thing I found out is I've always been good at manipulating. I'm a salesman, and so I, I've sold stuff all my life. If you, I had a guy told me one time, he come in to buy a vehicle, and he said, two things, I don't want a Ford truck, and I hate the color blue. And he, he left out of there with a blue Ford truck. <laughs> I've always had the ability to, to make somebody do what I wanted them to do, and this is not a quality. Maybe it is now that I'm trying to get people to find Jesus, but before it wasn't a quality. Um, we, uh, so the point I'm trying to make is we can't manipulate God. This recovery program, we have been very good at manipulating everybody in the whole world. But this thing is between you and God, and you can't manipulate God. And so only you and I know if our lives are unmanageable. And what I'm finding out is, is that when we start talking to people, we find out they're unmanageable. From, but from the outside looking in, they look like they've got it all together, but they don't. What I'm calling us to tonight is to kind of analyze ourselves and realize, number one, some of us, let me back up. Number one, everybody in this room needs recovery from something. The pastors preach this over and over again, and, and we kind of hesitate. Uh, you know, people that are in drug addiction maybe not feel like the same as somebody that, that has trouble spending money or eating too much or whatever, but it, the fact of the matter is we are. We're all the same, and we need help from it. Romans seven fifteen through 17, New Living Translation says, I don't really understand myself for what I want to do, what it, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. We have a sinful nature. Whatever inside of us wants to do what's not right. We agree with that. We, we, do, we are powerless to control the tendency to do the wrong thing. We have to have God's help because by ourselves, we are our, our flesh by itself always wants to do the wrong thing. No matter what we're talking about, whether it's smoking dope, whether it's smoking cigarettes, whether it's not doing what God wants us to do, whatever it is, we cannot control the tendency. We are powerless over that. Um, if you feel distant from God or lack the motivation to trust him with your life, Get connected with God. Um, you know, it's so easy to say, get connected to God. And I remember growing up, said, read the Bible, pray more, um, get connected to God. And, and, you know, this year has been so different for me because um, I have purposely set out to get connected to God and, and been reading the bread every day. And I'm going to tell you, there's been many days that I don't get what it's saying. Um, I don't, but I've read it. I've missed a couple days this year, um, but I have read it. I'm learning to pray in the Spirit with God because before it was more of a kneel down at the altar and go in the prayer room, and it was more of a formal check-the-box type of prayer. Now I'm learning to be in the Spirit every day, and it, it may be it's just being aware of God and everything that's going on around me, and God is teaching me that that is what he has designed me to do, is to be one with him throughout the day. Um, so anyway, that, that helps with getting you connected to God. This lesson is necessary because it allows you to put your faith in the Lord. The key to ending worry, anxiety, and many of your fears, Philippians 4, 10 through 13, which we talked about, Pastor talked about in the message the other night. How I praise the Lord. That you are concerned about me again, I know you have not always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me because we weren't ready. Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content for what, with whatever I have. I know how to live almost, almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it, it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And also when a truck don't run right, 
you know, because I want to pray these things. I want to hear these. I want to quote these scriptures. But then whenever I have to go through this stuff, I really ain't trying to hear it. But as I'm learning, you know, I told Cody called me today, and he's he's kind of my man. Um, we we talked through a bunch of stuff, and he just started laughing at me when I started telling him about this truck deal. Although, and my guys at work, they have to hear my lessons every day because uh, they just do. I'm practicing. But it was like I come in this morning. I said, man, I don't figure something out. This truck deal, God's talking to me. They said, you're nuts. But, but it's a fact. Being aware of that, hearing God, what he's trying to tell me. Um, celebrate recovery principle number one is to realize that I am not God. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing, and my life is unmanageable. All I've ever done my entire life was try to be God, and it has failed miserably. I thought, and then whenever I, I was told get connected with God or, or have a relationship with God, here's how I thought that went. I sit back here in the chair somewhere, and I say, okay, God, new truck, need that tomorrow. Wife needs to do this, need a new house. Need my son to act this way, my daughter to act this way. I had no idea what a relationship with God meant. No idea whatsoever. Um, Matthew 5 and 3 in the, in the King James Version says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit means that we know, blessed means happy. Poor in spirit means that we know we need God. Never more in my entire, never more in my life do I realize that I need God. I need Him in every aspect of my life, whether it be from figuring out what's going on with the truck, with my wife, at church, no matter what it is, I need Him in my life. And I tell Him every single day. I want Him to know that. Romans seven eighteen says, And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. Um, we do have a sinful nature, and we, we, I think I might have just read that scripture, but anyway. Celebrate Recovery uses many acronyms. An acronym is an abbreviation form with the initial letters of the words and pronounced as a word. So with this lesson, the acronym for powerless, which spells out the things that may be preventing you from gaining true serenity, which is peace. So powerless spells out pride which is elevation of self, or we learn from the pastor, a decline of self, meaning you think very poorly of yourself. Only ifs, man, people that's been in drug addiction and messed up their whole life, I mean, all the money I've made selling cars, all the money I've made, period, man, if I'd have just done this right, if I'd have done this right, keeps us trapped in denial, in being powerless. Worry. Escape, resentments, loneliness, emptiness, selfishness, separation. Um, recovery is a 12-step Christ recovered program for anyone who has any one of these hurts, habits, or hang-ups. Truth is, we all have them. Whether you've had problems with drug or alcohol or just need some support, encouragement in your life, recovery is the place for you. And I don't just say that cliché. Matter of fact, I told this to the pastor the other night. This is life or death. What we're teaching is life or death. I have been in the church for 50 years and baptized in Jesus' name, received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and I have struggled my entire life. Now, I knew God. I knew who he was. But I struggled with living life because, number one, I didn't know how to talk to people about what was going on in my life. Me and Chris has talked about this many times in Steph. You know, we, we didn't know how to talk to people about stuff. We just we just didn't talk about it. And now all of us guys are talking about feelings all the time. It's like, what in the world's wrong with that? <laughs> We're a bunch of sissies. But, but I'm going to tell you, we've grown, haven't we, guys? We have. Powerless means we lack the power to prevent something from happening. What I've learned is other than myself, pretty much every other thing that we go through in a day, we are powerless over anything about it. We have no control over what happens. Um, we tend to obsess over the thing we are trying to control. Can we relate to that? We need to, uh, but we can't. For example, an alcoholic who is powerless over his or her desire for a drink may obsess over having one more drink. How many of us know in drug addiction it was always just one more? 
and then we get to thinking about that. You know, honestly, I was never told that we were we had compulsive behaviors. Now, here's the deal. So, so I'm past that today, thank God. But, but it relates to my wife buys a whole pack of Reese's candy bars. Reese's is my favorite thing. She buys them pumpkins or them Christmas tree deals. Is it about that thick? I eat every single one of them in one night. Every single time she buys them, I eat them. I cannot eat one. I eat the whole box. So it applies in so many parts of our life. But basically, I obsess. I love them. They're there. I want to eat them. I eat them. Uh, it's not a good thing. Um, so I want to read real quick the serenity prayer. We're talking about being powerless over things in our life. This is another cliche thing that happens in, in recovery. A lot of things we just say, and I think we say them over and over and over again until one day finally they, man, that's actually works. Serenity prayer says, God, grant me the serenity, which is peace, to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, which is huge. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, which is what I always do. Trusting that you will make all things right because we either believe in God or we don't. If I surrender to your will, if I really believe and surrender to your will, I might be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next, which we talked about heaven the other night. That's what we get. I had on here to, <clears throat> to tell where I, where I had my first encounter with, with accepting things that I cannot change. I worked come out of prison this last time and brother billy tanner um and john palmer uh had me working for him i was spraying for brother billy and uh and he bought this two hundred fifty thousand dollar, maybe even more than that spray rig and wanted me to drive it i never drove a tractor in my life he put me on it and he said clint's gonna teach you how to drive it he put me on it he showed me how to drive from from the shop to the washout which is about five miles and he said get after it and i'm like come oh, on i can't do it he said you can do it just go well i was so careful but that day came because i was i said you know what if i tear something up he said if you do it, it'll be all right one day i hit the boom on the side of a telephone pole and it just wrinkled that joker all up it's about fifteen thousand dollars to fix it and i called him i said billy i have totally messed up i've done wrecked this thing and bent this uh boom all the pieces and he said i'll be down there in a little bit and he comes down and he said well let's just load her up and take her to the shop i'm like what do you mean i'm just twenty thousand dollars i just messed up he said ain't nothing we can do about it let's go it's gonna be all right their motto that they had ever i mean we had major things go wrong all the time and they always said it's gonna be all right and it got me to thinking and and, and we've talked about this even in our uh, men's meeting sometimes you think about your life from now, as far back as you can remember, anything we ever had an issue with or we thought was a big deal, it always worked out, didn't it? it we're here. It always works out. But yet, the very first time my truck starts missing, I'm the world's coming to an end and my life is terrible. I'm mad at the wife, mad at my son. We just, we just mess it all up. When we obsess over something, we have a persistent idea, emotions, desire, feelings that we cannot seem to get rid of. Because of our obsession, doing the right thing or making the right choice is nearly impossible. Examples I have, smoking, doing meth, getting off meth, doing Adderall, um, eating, went on a diet, or know that I'm gaining weight but can't stop eating. Or, better yet, when God has told me something to do, and I just don't want to do it. Example, Jonah. We just talked a lesson on Jonah. Um, God told Jonah to go preach to preach at Nineveh. Judgment was coming. Jonah didn't want to do it. So he decided he was just going to go his own way, which led to a very unmanageable life. He got, you, you know the story there. <clears throat> um, 
much time probably done went over. But anyway, it's all right. How about when God has told us to do something? Um, sorry, I messed up. What can I do about powerlessness? Once you understand this, you realize that there is nothing you can do because you have no control over obsessiveness. However, there is something you can do. You have the ability to turn to God and let him do what you are unable to do. Pause and give it to God. Um, so many different things I want to talk about, so many different things that I've mentioned to people and trying to think of what God wants me to say um, specifically. Well, one, for, in, for instance, smoking. I remember when I was trying to quit, and I tried to quit so many times. And I remember John D. Henry. God loved him. Just throw him down. That's what I did. And I'm like, shut up. You didn't throw nothing down. You smoked 20 cigarettes. I mean, I'm telling you, I didn't believe it. Still don't believe it. I love him, but I still don't believe it. But he said, just throw him down. Well, I tried to I threw cigarette packs out 100 times. I mean, I tried my best to quit, um, but it never worked out for me. Uh, let me get. But every time I thought about it, again, that obsessive thought, what we do? We go buy another pack of cigarettes. So when I, I tried to deal smoke one a day, one an hour, one a week, what y'all know about that, right? Make all that stuff up to try to quit. It just never worked. But when I finally said, God, I cannot quit smoking. I cannot quit this. I'm done. I'm done trying. Matter of fact, I'm going to smoke cigarettes. And I did. I quit worrying about it. And matter of fact, I told this only to my wife. When I said I quit smoking, because I believe God healed me one night. Can't remember what night it was. God healed me. I told my wife, I'm done. I still smoked after that. But I knew God healed me, and I kept claiming that God healed me, and I gave that to God, and before long, I was not smoking cigarettes anymore. Thank God to that, because it, I gave it to him. <clears throat> Another real small thing to some, but it's a big thing to me, for 50 years I've wanted to, well, maybe not 50, but 30, I've wanted to get up early in, my, in the morning. I, I, my wife, she gets up 5 o'clock. She does a million things in the morning. I get up at 7.15, and I'm out the door at 7.22 every morning. She can tell you, I'm talking about seven minutes. You better not talk to me. No problems. I'm out the door. But I hate that about myself. One of my things, I want to be able to get up sooner. And... Uh, and I've prayed. I've told the men. I've told several people in my life that that, uh, that I talked to, you know, God help me. I want to be able to get up early in the morning and start my day off with you. You know, and just the other day I told this to Cody on the phone. Today, I just realized I've been waking up 30 minutes early every day, reading my bread before I get out of the, before I get out of the bed. And I don't even know how it happened except that I give it to God, and God done it. I couldn't do it myself. <clears throat> Except that you're powerless. Be willing to ask for God's intervention. This includes having a pastor, having a sponsor, having an accountability team. God speaks through them. A lot of times, my whole life, you know, I got God. He'll tell me what to do. And then I just walk around waiting on the burning bush. And I got all these people trying to talk or speak into my life. And I'm wanting to know, where are you at, God? And he's trying to talk to me. you got to put people in your life. You have to be active with your pastor. And that don't. And I'm going to say this, that don't necessarily mean tell him that your toenail hurts and everything in the world is going on in your life. But there are things you need to talk to your pastor about. We teach you need a sponsor, which is basically a pastor uh, in our recovery world. That doesn't take the place of a pastor, but it's somebody that you can trust to help you through situations. And then you need a cheerleading team, accountability team, people that help keep you accountable. God speaks through every one of them. You need to talk to them every day. Make your relationship with God your number one priority. This takes intentional effort. If we seek God like we sought after the things in life we really, really wanted, God promises us we'll find them. I tell everybody in recovery ever since we started, if you seek for God like we did the dope, we will be 
talking to a burning bush. You know, you may not have done dope, but there is something in your life and only you know what it is that was super important to you. And if you search for God like you did then, which means you were thinking about it when you went to bed, you couldn't sleep at night, or you was thinking about it in the morning when you got up, if you did that as much with God, you would have a relationship with him, and it would be way different probably than what it is now. <clears throat> Serve and love others. I put pastors told us over and over again, when we start being critical feel let, we, and feel powerless over our own life, and it has truly become unmanageable, find somebody to win to God. Find somebody to pour into and then come back. All of a sudden, all that critical thinking and all that stuff goes away. Now that you understand your problem, what you have power over and what you don't, you can totally accept your current situation and then turn to God for help. So you, now you've taken the first step, coming out of denial and into reality, where you can clearly see as, as uh, A.J., one of our guys in recovery, says, being very rigorous, honest, because rigorously honest, because I found out I lied to myself all the time. I, I couldn't even really tell you w what my life was and what needed to be worked on because I had these program responses about my life that were not true. Matter of fact, I told so much about myself that wasn't true. It was just crazy. You have to be honest. Um, so... You probably heard that the, that the Celebrate Recovery Serenity Prayer, which asks God to help us recognize what we can and cannot control and to give us the power to see the difference. Now is the time to admit you are powerless over the things that rob you of serenity, which is peace that you're so desperately seeking. Let's look, and I'm about to wrap it up by another two hours. <laughs> see you, somebody said did you say that? Lord, you told me you loved me the other day. But you must be tired. Okay. <laughs> she is honest, isn't she? That's right. So I, put, I encourage you to discuss these things and how they affect you in your small group, step study, or a notebook. Write things down. We've learned that in recovery. It's important to write things down. Yeah, I know you and God know it, right? That's what I said all my life. God knows it, but you got to write the stuff down. you got to talk to people. Uh, it makes a difference. My kids just walked in and said, it's time to go. <laughs> Y'all shut up. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Uh, they threw me off. <laughs> write it down. Talk to people. you got to talk to people. Me and Larry send stuff to each other all the time that we get from each other, it's important. you got to talk to people. Me and Cody call, talk on the phone. Me and Blake text on the phone. Oh, Terrence, we talk on the phone. It matters. You have to talk to people. Get you a team of people. Um, pride. We're talking about things that can stand in our way of admitting we are powerless to control our tendency to do the wrong thing. Pride prevents us self, prevents us from admitting our problems. We are too proud. When we mix pride with our lack of understanding in the situation and the power we have to control our mind and body, we create a deadly mixture. We control how we respond to certain situations and how we react. And when we don't understand something, we often lash out and behave poorly. I just have to say this one quick thing. that how many, Have you all have seen the uh, uh, deal on Facebook where it's talking about anger and it, it's an iceberg? And anger's at the top, right above the water, and then below it's all these symptoms, all these feelings, Cody. It's on that wheel we got. You know, I remember all my life, my wife specifically, uh, and now my children, you know, Dad, you're mad. Well, what it really was, was I was scared half to death, or I was bewildered, or I was upset, or I was disappointed, or I was whatever the feeling was, but it manifested itself as anger, which caused me to lash out. You know, what recovery does is it lets us figure out what in the world we're thinking, what we're feeling about ourselves, and be able to deal with it. Because one thing Kevin Abernathy said that I'll never forget, I love him to death, he said, 
he said one night in our meeting, he said, I was either happy or mad. And really, that's the way I was my whole life. I had no idea how to deal with all that other stuff. And then they brought me this wheel that's got like a hundred different feelings on it. And I'm like, I had to look them up. Didn't even know what they meant. But as I started searching, that's the point I'm trying to make the tools about this. As I started searching, what's this mean? What's this mean? What's this mean? All of a sudden, I realized I could express how I was feeling rather than acting all goofy and mad. Um, doesn't it feel better to just trust God with the things we can't control and the things we don't understand instead of filling ourselves with worry and anxiety, being able to express how we actually feel? For a while as a man, this felt very uncomfortable. I was so used to always being the person that had all the answers, and I think every man in this room can totally relate to that. We were taught, just deal with it. And I did the best I could for 40-something years <clears throat> or had an answer that doing nothing and waiting on God seemed weak. But God showed me, Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And how does that sound compared to unmanageability? It sounds exactly like what I want in my life. Unrealistic expectations or fantasy lands keep us trapped. I have some preconceived notion that because I'm finally doing what the Lord wants me to do, I'm guaranteed some kind of perfect life. Doing the steps taught me something about myself. I thought it was Stacy's fault, pastor's fault, kid's fault, everybody else's fault. Well, here's what I found out about myself. I found out that I was a good person. I did a lot of good things for people. But really, I did them so that I could be entitled to do whatever I wanted to do. And that's not the way things... So that, that's another tool I learned about myself, and it, it kept me trapped uh, for doing the things that I did. If you focus on the past and the decisions or actions you could have taken, you won't be able to see what's in front of you. The key to doing this is practicing mindfulness, Cody. Mindfulness, with mindfulness, you stay in the present moment. You don't think about what could have been or if only. I've made it a point lately to be yoked with the Lord, totally in the spirit throughout the day, to be mindful of what he's trying to do through me and not so worried about me. And it has completely transformed my life. I don't even think about me. I think about what in the world is he trying to tell me. I hear conversations that's happening at work with people that I work with and think, all right, Lord, I'll put that in my memory bank. I need to talk about that later. And he's doing a work in my life. Worrying too much prevents us from trusting God. I feel like I'm getting better at this but still have some work to do. But I'm going on record by saying when we are worrying, I feel we just don't believe God's word. And I'm saying that for myself. I'm not saying that against anybody here which says he will take care of us. When I worry, I don't believe he's going to take care of it, and I really want to hop back on that throne and be God and do something which I already know is going to be the wrong thing. I'm glad I'm getting past that. Let go of the worries that are weighing heavy on your heart and mind. Instead, turn your cares and concerns over to the Lord. He's always there ready to listen to you, listen to what you have to say, and trust his plan for your life. We learn weight on him, and, and it makes a difference. <clears throat> His plan for your life is to seek and save that which is lost. We have to get ready to work. There's a whole world out there, and they are depending on us to get it right. And when I finally, and I'm telling you, I'm not saying this like I can do it right because I, the people that know that talk to me every day, I get it wrong way more days than I get it right. But some days I get it right, and when I do get it right, and when I'm actually actively seeking for somebody that God is putting in my path, all the rest of my issues that I've been thinking about, they go to the wayside. If you feel uneasy or uncertain about his plan for your life, pray about it. Tell him your concerns. Trust me. Say it out loud. Write it down. Let me, let me say this. Say it to your sponsor. Say it to your friend. We found out through men's meeting, there's, some, there's two or three specific things that I actually spoke it out and said, God is going to have to help me with this because I have no idea what to do. I said that to another human being, and then God took care of it. 
I didn't even say it to him. I said it to somebody I trusted. God heard that and honored that. It makes a difference. Resentments, they make us stuck. It's easy to stay mad at people. It's simple to keep resenting things, people, circumstances, and the way we feel inside. What isn't easy is letting go of those resentments and learning to be happy. I just wonder how many times God has forgiven us of the very same things we resent in other people. In fact, what I'm learning, when I resent a person, place, or circumstance, it's usually God pointing out something in me that needs to be worked on. It's not really even about the person or the circumstance. It's about what God's trying to tell me in my own life. We've had this conversation at home many times. Somebody drive me nuts. I can't hardly even stand to be around them. And then here's the part when I'm really honest about that. It's because I don't like something in them that's still in me. God's trying to get out of it. Loneliness can prevent us from moving forward. Instead of having a cold shoulder toward others, learn to love others. Build relationships up through forgiveness, understanding, and compassion. You need connections with other people to get past your troubles. And I'll be honest with you, I have absolutely no idea how you all, if you do it this way, get through life without other people. I mean, I got Cody, Blake, Terrence, uh, David, I mean, all Derek, Larry, Freddie, Kevin Dawson. I've got all kinds of people that I call every day, and if I didn't have them, I don't know how I'd make it. I believe God sent them into my life. It takes other people to help us uh, get through life. Don't be lonely. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6 and 2. We were never meant to do life alone. We, need the lo- we, were, cre- we were created for relationship. We need the love and care of others as much as they are needed by others in the same ways. Selfishness. And separation stops us from growing with God. It's easy to be selfish. When we pray, we often just ask for help or ask for things of this world. We forget to thank the Lord for all the blessings he's given us. Make sure your prayer life is balanced with gratitude and requests. I feel like I've graduated from the prayer of me, 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 me. You know, I'm praying now. Now, some days, I, I'm telling you, I don't get it right all the time, but I'm telling you, I'm speaking in faith. But I'm, I pray, God, help me find the person. You know, pastor said this the other day, and I, I'm wrapping up. I don't even know if I'm too long. I'm less than GL, for sure, pastor. <laughs> so y'all getting the treat. But this truck was messing up. This truck, man, it's a big deal, if y'all ain't noticed. But we was at the deer woods, and I couldn't even go hunting that afternoon because I got gas all over me. It was a major malfunction. And he said, I think it's the coal pack. So I, I said, well, all right, I'll go Sykes and get the coal pack. And as I drove up there, I remembered him saying, just maybe it's because you're supposed to see somebody at the parts store. And I, on the way up, I thought, you know what? Truck's still running. Ain't that big a deal. Lord, who are you trying to send me? You know, who, who are you sending me to? I promised before the Lord, I got to the stoplight in front of Lowe's. I had the window up, no radio on, because I was still mad because I was coming up there. And I heard somebody screaming my name, and I looked over, and here was Dustin and Samantha, from, used to come to recovery, saying, hey, and, and we talked through the window, and happy, and, you know, glad to see them with their kids. They had all their kids with them in the car. Thank God for them doing good. And it was like the Lord just showed me. It's pretty simple if you just do what I tell you to do. Uh, always, also, don't forget he's always there for you. You're not alone in this world. The Holy Ghost is always with you. You just need to have faith and know that God has your back. We have to overcome our pride and denial, and we have to ask for help. We have to ask for help. If only I did this, if only I got this, if only I made a lot of money, Etc. Etc. We have to get rid of this mentality and focus on what God wants in our life. Give all my worries to God. Really believe Hebrews 11 and 6 when it says, And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists 
and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Quit turning to coping behaviors that have not worked over and over and over in my life. How about Proverbs 3 and 5 when it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and what? He will direct your path. Forgive people that you're angry, have resentments with. How about in Luke 6, 37, it says, Forgive and you'll be forgiven. That void we've been searching for for our whole life is Jesus Christ. I tell this to people in recovery all the time. Everything we ever did, every drug we ever took, every food we ever ate, everything we ever did, we were trying to fill that void that sin took from our life. We was trying to feel happy for a moment. I'm now finding out all we, all we need to do is fill that void with Jesus. And when we do that, we're going to be full forever. Quit being selfish with my time, money, and life. God tells us in Mark 8, 35, for whoever wants to save their life, guess what? They're going to lose it. <laughs> I told the guys today at work, I was crying about something, and then I remembered that scripture I put on this deal, and I read it, and I said, well, I guess if I signed up for this, I'm planning on losing my life. It ain't mine anymore. It's not what I want, but we lose it. Whoever loses their life for me, that's Jesus, and for the gospel, they'll save it. He brings up four great points. Stop denying the pain you're in. Stop playing God. Start admitting your powerlessness. Start admitting your life has become unmanageable. And once you can do those things, you're ready to move to step two in recovery. I'll tell you that I really appreciate the opportunity. I know it was a little bit long. Meredith, I went over. Am I okay? No. Down. But I'm thankful for the opportunity. I love the Lord, and I'm thankful for what he's done in my life. Uh, Brother Blake, will you lead us out in prayer? I'm very thankful for Brother Shane, and that was a that was a powerful word, Amen. Uh, Lord, we love you. I'm so grateful for your word. I'm so grateful that there's healing and there's change in this place. And Lord, like like I've been praying already, like we've talked about on Thursday night, Lord, it's not coincidence that there is recovery in our church. It's not coincidental that you've placed us here. Lord, I pray that somebody get convicted about this and really seek you. Lord, I pray that somebody, Lord, will just seek you with their whole heart. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.